Hi folks, um, good evening, welcome to today's TD show. Uh, I want to start today's show with obviously the very bad news, um, sad news that hit us yesterday with the passing of Susan Cantor. Um, for those who don't know Susan, she was a long time employee of US Chess, uh, 15 years, and um, she was heavily involved in everything. Uh, if you ever communicated with US Chess, um, anything to do with tournament directors, uh, rating reports specifically, uh, if you had things to do with national scholastics, team rooms, any of those events, um, you probably liaised with Susan um, over your time at US Chess. Um, she was definitely a character in chess control um, over the past few years, and Susan's um, touch on the chess scene was enormous, and she will be uh, sadly uh, missed by everybody um, in the chess world, especially US chess. Um, as Enrique Huerta just said in the chat there, um, <clears throat> she definitely made the job of the Chief TD uh, much easier. Um, and having been in those shoes, um, I can definitely attest that that is the case. Um, our thoughts go out to Alan and all of Susan's family and friends at this time. and. Uh, yeah, it's very sad news. Okay, um, let's get on with tonight's TD show. And thank you everyone for joining us. Um, tonight, we are uh, very happy to be joined by Associate National Tournament Director, uh, Jim Hodina. Jim, good evening, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, I'm glad to be here. Um, so, um, Jim, just um, let me touch base with a couple of things. I normally ask how you got into being a TD, uh, mm -hmm. but given uh, I'm going to bypass that question, and <laughs> okay. given your your um, uh, position in the public health, I believe the yep. public health sector, um, yes. I know you were involved in a tournament that happened over the board um, at the end of June, beginning of July, and get your opinion on how you felt that event went and um what you know i know you put some you know uh, you, you know you were explaining it was a um low number of players round robin so you're able to do sure. things much more controlled how did you think the event went overall um very very pleased with the way that the event went uh, as you mentioned it was a round robin event with eight players it was our state championship and those eight players all qualified for the event we actually added a couple spots for our senior champion and our Dinker representative since they were unable to uh, attend in person at uh, the national events uh, for their for their respective championships. Uh, we uh, worked with the players several weeks in advance to identify uh, needs for uh, that they may have in regard to safety. We obviously, uh, me working in public health, have laid out uh, approaches for decontamination. Uh, people had to wear masks. One player chose to also wear a face shield uh, over the mask. And then uh, we, we bleached the pieces down and the boards down between each round. Uh, one person was hard of hearing, and so he had concerns about uh, his opponent wearing a mask, offering a draw. Right. and not hearing the draw offer so we made yes. arrangements for for that as well so that it could be communicated uh, uh, through other mechanisms okay and then with the so we we can all obviously see the covid situation um you know where i i don't know in iowa whether it's getting worse or better but mm -hmm. would you um still contemplate running such an event uh even now or I think this, the nature of the event being small with eight players and you could control the environment as well as ensure that all the players understood uh, the requirements. Uh, they didn't even touch each other's pieces when capturing. We were able to make arrangements for, for the exchange of pieces without, without wow. uh, touching each other's pieces. Um, I have a, a, a regional four-state event that I run uh, just before Thanksgiving and I chose to cancel it because uh, it was a lot of scholastic players involved, people coming from multiple states to a single location, which is also uh, a concern about uh, 
from CDC's perspective uh, of uh, incur um, additional community spread when you're bringing people from all around the country sure. uh, to one location. Whereas in Iowa, we were a little more confined uh, with regard to our uh, geographic dispersion of players. Yeah. All right. Great. Well, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. So let's um, let's get into a wonderful topic that we started last week with Mike Hoffpower, um, where we were talking about player conduct. Um, mm -hmm. And last week it was all about player behavior. And Mike was uh, it seemed like the perfect guest to to have on the show to um, <clears throat> teach us all how to curb bad player behavior. Of course, the other aspect of player conduct is the use of uh, additional resources, as we're calling it. Um, so as we'll, we'll, we'll get into what that means as we move through the presentation here. So let me start uh, the presentation with the same um, um, picture that Mike had had a show last week of Loki here. Uh, Loki apparently is the symbol of a bad boy. Um, so this this is the type of player we do not need at our events, but is the type of player that you're invariably going to come across um, yes. during during the events, unfortunately. <laughs> so let's let's get into uh, and again we're talking about section twenty uh, of the U.S. Chess Rulebook here. Um, so it's all to do with conduct of players and spectators. I will say um, if you're interested in spectators. Um, we did a previous episode of that with Tom Brownscombe, uh, where we went over issues relating to spectators. Mike Hoffpower did uh, various things on the player conduct side of things, like I said last week. Uh, it's good to check out that episode mm -hmm. as well. Uh, I'm going to put a little link in the chat here um, so people can find the videos if they need them of past episodes. And then also now we're going to, with Jim, I'm going to cover the rest of section 20. So let's let's get into it. And 20A, as we've already seen uh, last week and with the spectator one, uh, 20A, uh, players participate in the spirit of fair play and good sportsmanship, and everyone must observe the US code, uh, chess code of ethics. And now if someone signs up as a member or whatever, there's, there's a, a disclaimer that you have to um, sign saying that you agree to all this now, uh, various things. So if you go mm -hmm. to renew your membership, etc., you will come across this. Um, one thing we'd like to talk about in relation to now, um, instead of player behavior, um, use of additional resources um, and, and the online world that there is now. <clears throat> uh, what sort of a difference do we have between over the board versus online? And is there a difference when it comes to use of additional resources? Sure. I think uh, just the the temptation to be able to access without being caught is, is there. I was very interested in Mike's observation, uh, I think reported on uh, some other online tournament where they found it was it was the young chess player who hadn't learned uh, as much perhaps as maybe a seasoned player, the ethics of chess and what it meant to use other resources and, and what the repercussions are if you, if you do, right. so. Yeah, and one very interesting thing that came out, and I don't know if you've been watching, so on the US Chess YouTube channel, you'll see these town hall meetings that have been prior to the delegates meetings. And there was one, the Scholastic Council meeting um, was very interesting. And they spoke about online um, chess. And so they had some issues during the national invitational events for those who aren't aware. Um, there were a couple of players um, that got basically, um, you know, found to be violating the fair play policies during the Barber and the Rockefeller events, unfortunately. And then also I've had, um, I don't know, I've been running these morning membership events um, and I've just today had to uh, basically um, boot two players out of uh, participating in future mm -hmm. events and, um, you know, uh, change rating reports and whatever, uh, because they were found to be violating the fair play um, policies too. And one of the things that came up was that when we're communicating with these players, um, especially younger players, the chances are we're sending emails and whatever, you know, we're putting in there about, um, you know, if you violate the fair play, you're going to lose your account, you're going to be up on an ethics com you know, complaint, you're going to lose this, you know, you're going to be, you know, and all this, but the emails are going to the parents. And right. that information isn't necessarily being communicated to these kids and the parents, you know, 
mm-hmm. probably a little oblivious sometimes to oh, the, yeah. the technical ability of some of these um, kids <laughs> and what they can do. Um, you well, know, so, and, and it, it's just so one of the things they try to um, you know, state is that when you're communicating, especially these events, is that you make sure that the parents actually you know, explain this information to the kids um about you know things that they're not meant to be doing and the repercussions um you know that that will face them um yeah we uh ran a our chess camp a couple weeks ago online normally we meet in person and we did it on zoom and we set up meeting rooms and so forth like that to break them out for individual instruction but uh i was quite surprised early on how many parents just set the child in front of the computer and walked away and I never saw them the rest of the day and I can imagine similar things might happen in a tournament as well yeah Uh, but please don't think it's just kids um, no that that are that are not playing by the rules and like we said here in online um, if you don't have um, if you don't have cameras on them or you're not screen sharing or not doing various things the the ability you know the opportunity to um, use a chess computer or grab a book or listen, you know, to someone else, um, you know, is just immense. And you, you, uh, if you're just using the, the algorithms that these servers have, um, if, if players are smart about it or, you know, they don't have to be too, you know, there, there might be ways to get around this. So it's just, um, and I think David Hader mentioned that mm-hmm. the, they've been, CCA has been running some events recently uh, online and he said if they submitted an ethics complaint for every single you know um, cheating claim they'd had so far that they were able to you know um, state that categorically that the player was cheating they it would cost them eighteen hundred dollars right now uh, which I calculated to be over 70 I think ethics complaints that would that would run through and I don't think ethics has the capacity to deal with all of those um, so the online world really is um, a different ball game altogether um Mm -hmm. and you know once chapter 10 comes out the new one um definitely try and um you know if you're running online events definitely try and utilize chapter 10 um as you best you can and put into place as many um of the um Mm -hmm. procedures as you can but uh, there's a huge difference in, in using additional resources um for over the board versus online uh, you know over the board you can yeah, you know, as we'll see you know most of this presentation relates to over the board stuff but um you know just be aware that online it's yeah. it's it's a whole different game right now so and, and it's fresh in my you know fresh wound right now because of my morning membership events and because of what i've had to deal with today uh with yeah. these players as well so yeah yeah i think your mention of chapter 10 is really important i'm very much looking forward to see that published and being able to use the guidance that's provided in there exactly so let's get into uh, our uh, presentation. So moving on to 20B. Um, so 20B states use of recorded matter is prohibited. And you'll, you'll see the word prohibited is um, you know on all of these slides, I think. Um, so it, it this all seems like pretty much common sense to me, but the rules are there. So players are forbidden to make use of handwritten, printed, or otherwise recorded matter. Um, so that means a book or um, you know, um, any any sort of recorded matter, listening to a tape as it used to be on openings, you know, way back when, um, you know, so I definitely remember listening to a Collie tape that I had back in the 80s, I think, where I was learning the Collie opening. Uh, but yeah, as, as sad as that sounds. Yeah. Um, and then, um, so it, you know, while the penalty is at the discretion of a director, a forfeit loss is usually ruled if the material is relevant to the game, uh, while a lesser penalty or warning is common otherwise. And it gives an example of a player on move five of King's Indy defense getting forfeited if he's forfeited if he's reading a book um, on the King's Indian, uh, but maybe given a warning or a time penalty for mm-hmm. reading one on rook endings. It, it, yeah. it seems pretty common sense um, to me. Yep. But one of the things I've found is that some players, uh, some TDs are very scared to actually you know, pull the pull the card on the guillotine, so to speak, and forfeit a player um, if they're violating this type of thing. Um, and you've got to not do that. You know, you if, yeah. if someone is 
violating this uh, rule, it's it's serious. So don't don't let them get away with it. You're just um, not helping any few other future TDs where that player is going to play in their events. Yeah. It seems like a classic example is if you have a bookseller at the tournament and the player wanders over yeah. to uh, the bookseller room and starts looking through the books, people often ask questions. Yeah, I, I must admit, so am I allowed to admit that I've done this during one of my games? So it, it You was, did? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Way back in 19, 1990, um, oh, okay. I was a, a move runner at the Hastings International um congress so this hastings is a big tournament in the uk um mm -hmm. and i was my job as a move runner um was to write down the moves on score sheets that were played in the games and then run them through to where the commentary room was happening where the grandmaster would then comment on the moves and you know and and be able to have an audience and put them up on the on the boards in like a spec because they didn't have electronic displays <laughs> no. back then so so i was paid a, a very small fee to do this move running job well this was grandmaster chris ward who was a well-known sicilian dragon exponent uh you know at his time and still is and so i liked the white side of the dragon and he wanted the black side of the dragon so we we developed you know a, a bit of a you know um you know friendship while we were doing this so we got um chatting about the um the sicilian dragon so i said well why don't we have a game so while we were doing the move running um we were also playing a game that started as a sicilian <laughs> dragon well it got to about 11 moves and i was out of my theory and chris was obviously still well in his so i ran to the bookstore to grab a, <laughs> to grab a book on the dragon <laughs> uh. to try and help me but i i I mean, I had a quick flick through, but it didn't help because I, I was still having to do my job. So, yeah. You probably so, wrote the book, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. So, yeah. You know, but uh, yeah, anyway. So, that was fun. But anyway. Very yeah, I, w I would have been forfeited in, in that instance if, uh, sure, if a TD sure. had caught me. So, anyway. Uh, and then we got the TD tip and it talks about headphones. Um, so, headphones now are, are a little... I won't say outdated because everything still has headphones. You know, you get Bluetooth headphones now, but the things that the headphones are plugged into are more, Absolutely. you know, up to date. So you don't often get now a dedicated iPod that can only listen to music or going even further back, a Walkman or, you know, uh, some, you know, something, a radio, you know, something going further back. Um, so, um, you know, more often than not, if they're listening to it with a cell phone or something along those lines, you, mm. you're not going to let them use a cell phone um, yeah. while, while they're playing the games and stuff. But um, it, it talks about headphones here. Um, it's not a violation of Rule 20B. Remember, this is a TD ta uh, tip. Um, you know, as a TD, you're allowed to inspect whatever the, um, um, you know, uh, whatever mm. it is that they're listening to. Um, and various things on those lines and maybe now's a good time to bring up so um, tournaments themselves yep. will yeah. um, actually have uh, I'll bring this up here since uh, it's National Open and I helped write this one uh, they'll have their own electronic devices policies um, yep. and it, it basically so this one here talks about devices used to play music which cannot communicate or operate software Will generally be allowed well this this sort of gets rid of all of them um mm -hmm. nowadays um yeah. now the other thing this doesn't get rid of is things like noise cancelling headphones if people are using those um mm -hmm. you know i think you know it, unless you have an electronic device policy that out you know outlaws them um you know it's at the tournament director's discretion as to whether you know, you allow yeah. the player to use them. And a lot of times you'll get things like, say, will generally be allowed if the opponent does not object. So if as long as the opponent's comfortable with it, then you mm -hmm. as the TD would probably Absolutely. be comfortable with it as well. And you may have a difference between, um, you know, if you have a, um, you're, you're running a tournament in a club and you know most of the players, um, various things on those lines, as opposed to a big open tournament where there's a lot of mm -hmm. money at stake and things like that so um yeah yeah Anything and chris you said you helped write those uh 
regulations i'm sure you worked with the organizer and other tds yeah for, for sure yeah. yeah and actually we stole a lot of them from the cca regulations as well mm. you don't have to reinvent the wheel when you're coming up with this stuff there are a lot of events out there that have existing electronic devices policies um, and you can just go steal um, some of those and mm. customize them to your own needs depending on what you and the organizer um, would prefer in your tournament so it's not like you have to uh, come up with everything from scratch exactly <clears throat> all right let's move on to 20c um, use of notes prohibited so the use of notes made during the game as an aid to memory is forbidden um, aside from the actual recording of the moves draw offers and clock times and the head of information normally found on a score sheet uh, it does say that this is a much less serious offense than 20b um, so a warning or a minor time penalty is common um, and a more severe punishment if the offense is repeated I think we were talking about some examples of this, Jim. Um, sure. Uh, so sometimes players may make actual notes on their score sheets, uh, reminding them to even not even about moves, but just how they're how they need to be prepared for the for the game. Um, you could some people might uh, circle where time control is met. Uh, that in itself might be a very minor incident and you would as a TD not not address this under a, as a note but it isn't expressly stated in the rules that you can do that yeah I, th I think there's, there's certain things that are not going to be helpful um, you know I mean underlying move move, move 40 uh, yep. if that's the time control is is helpful but in the spirit of the game is it really that you know drastic i don't think so it i wouldn't even give a warning for that um you know I, what what are we talking about well if people start writing moves that they wanted to play um say mm. analysis to refer back to them for later um yep. you know, definitely do not allow that type of stuff uh, because that's you know those moves could come up later on in the game and so they you know they've got something to jog their memory there and, and things mm -hmm. along those lines um you know, I think you were even mentioning things like players writing one, two, three when a three. repetition and you know and stuff like right. that. I, I you know I don't know about that type of stuff. Um it's it's to me it's not that egregious. Um to other TDs it might be. Um, you know, but what are you gonna you mm -hmm. warn the guy, but what are you gonna do? Make him cross out the one two, then he's got big blobs where the one and two are, <laughs> right? right? It, it's like not It's already there, uh, right? You can't right. unring the bell. Yeah, um, uh, someone's asking what about the count time clock? Um, so yeah. people, people can, you can write down the clock times, yes, you um, can. you know, says so that you in can, the book. Yeah. exactly. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's, it's fine. I've seen people do it both ways where they'll write down, you know, so it's gaming 90. Um, mm -hmm. so they'll write down 90 for the first move and 80, you know, 89 for the second move and whatever. Um, mm -hmm. or they'll write down, you know, how long they thought they took on that move or, you know, I think those are fine yeah. if you see some numbers. Um, Some I players would, like to annotate their game as they go, you know, exclam, question mark. Yeah, <laughs> I, you know, that, you know, that, that gets a little, you know, a that, little those, dicey are, those are a little less clear, I think. Yep. But I, uh, in the in the grand scheme of things, again, I don't, yeah. I don't think that. Yeah. But if they start putting stars all over the place and, and various, <laughs> you know, then, then it yeah. might be time to step in and just tell them to yep. stop. So, yep. Um, yep. And then we will um, go to 20D. Um, which is the next one. Now, use of additional chessboard or a computer is prohibited. Um, so this is, uh, again, to me, it's a bit of a common sense one. Uh, if someone is using an additional chessboard and has their game pulled up on it, um, or is using a computer, um, those are very, very serious violations. Right. Um, and usually the, um, you know, the, the, uh, forfeit losses normally right, right. awarded in those you know uh, situations mm -hmm. uh if someone's in the skittles room say analyzing the game with a friend um you know and, and it's the same position that's on the board as in the in the game room um you, your chances are you're taking them back to that board and telling them the game's over um you know and if obviously mm -hmm. if you catch them using a computer be it on their cell phone or whatever it is they're using, it's it's obviously yep. a forfeit loss. Um, I, I don't care how far into the game they are, even at that yep. stage. Um, you know. And so yeah, I've been the victim of uh, someone cheating using a computer, uh, getting up and going to the bathroom. So right, 
personally yeah, you, know how it feels. You were mentioning that was during the HB Global, right? The, yes. Uh, the million dollar event. Yeah, and you think today, did they really have strong computers on phones back then? But uh, <laughs> it, it managed to help him enough to pull out a losing position against me. So Exactly. Yeah, so I mean, this, you know, the, the, this rule now is probably very short, but I mean, it's very short and sweet. You know, it's to the point. If you're using a, comp, you know, an additional chessboard or a computer, then, you know, it's. it's and this gets back to your, to your discussion that you made, of course, uh, with online play versus <clears throat> over the board play. Yeah, exactly. So, and then um, we're getting to 20E, uh, which is soliciting or using advice is prohibited. Um, now, this does actually cover two aspects, um, but during play, players are forbidden to make use of any notes, sources, information, or, or advice. So we've already got a rule that talks about notes. Um, here, it, it talks about it again, but uses information or advice, solicited or not, or analyze on another chessboard. Again, that's, that's, you know, I find a lot of the rules actually just reinforce other rules as well and talk about, mm -hmm. um, you know. Um, there's a question in the chat saying, what about demo boards or broadcasts of top games? Should GMs only look at their actual boards? Um, mm. It's very difficult to to stop a GM from looking at the demo boards that are going on in the same um, room where they are. Uh, I think it's now um, pretty common practice that uh, you know, you're allowed to, um, you know, um, you are allowed to to look at whatever is on display in the room. Um, that's like saying you can't go and look at the other games that are being played in case you come across the same position, um, you know, various things. I don't think there's anything you can do to stop that. Another question in the chat that we have from, uh, I think, Anand, can players have an actual board next to them when they are playing online, even if they are not analyzing, or is it still a violation of 20D? So what I will say, Anand, is that tournaments now are putting regulations into place that state whether a player can or cannot have an additional board with them um, your your issue with the additional board is um, if someone is watching that on a zoom camera is you know can they really tell that the board matches the the computer screen position um, you know if the player is analyzing on the board and starts moving pieces around it's going to cause a problem. Um, I I prefer the idea that I don't want to see a chessboard in the room. Uh, personally, um, you know, it's the games that I like to TD online are usually short enough that don't allow for people to you know move pieces on a board. But I know there are some longer time control tournaments out there where they have allowed this. Um, I'm not very comfortable with it because what do you do if you get a situation where the board doesn't match the screen um, and the player, the opponent can see that or the TD sees that or if he makes a move on the board and then accidentally makes a different move on the screen, you know, you've got to have policies about which one supersedes the other and various things. I, I think it just makes it messy. But um, it, I would recommend that tournament directors put that into their or organizers put that into the regulations if they're using online events. Um, of course, if you just, um, you're not using Zoom cameras and whatever else, you're, they're just playing. How do you know whether a player has a board or not, right? And what they're doing on that. Um, again, you know, that is a form of cheating. Uh, if they're analyzing on the board uh, and it's against the rules, you know, the online rules um, do not supersede the US chess rules here. What's in 20 are the actual rules. Um, so for, even for online chess as well. So, um, you know, but how do you ever find that out is, is the question, right? So, um, yeah, and uh, someone says there are boards that can hook up to the chess server and communicate the moves directly uh, from the board onto the server. And then likewise, you know, I think there are even some now that move the piece back for you uh, when your opponent makes a move. You know, it's, it's a little slow, but I've seen it wow. you know, happen. Uh, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, it, my recommendation is that organizers or TDs mm -hmm. make sure that whatever yeah. um, they're doing is written into the rule set for, for that particular time. So I'm not going to say it's against the rules. I'm not going to say it's, you know, the rules mm -hmm. allow it. Um, the rules, specifically 20D, don't allow um, yeah. analysis on an extra board, but your online rule may allow, you know, a yeah. board to be the main board. And basically what the computer screen is capturing is just 
you know, what is being played on the board so that they're playing like regular chess. So anyway, so let's get into the aspect of 20E that we're going to cover um, because this is um, solicited advice. So solicited advice is when a player either asks for advice, you know, from someone else um, and then the other person gives them that advice. Um, that is solicited advice. Unsolicited advice is the other way around where a player receives advice that they didn't ask for um, along those lines. Um, so, mm -hmm. uh, but we covered all of that in our episode on spectators. So I invite people to go back and look at the YouTube um, um, archive on the TV show, find the issue on spectators where we covered a lot about unsolicited advice. Um, you know, spectators shouting out a move or telling mm -hmm. someone a flag had fallen or, you know, various things along those lines. So we covered all of that in there. But for the purposes of this one, solicited advice, the player conduct themselves, um, if someone's asking for any advice about a move, you know, it's, you know, they can't, they can't do that. Right. So, uh, or we talked a little bit, uh, Chris, about potentially signaling uh, between players and spectators uh, mm -hmm. as to advice as to whether a touch piece is a good move uh, in terms of where it's going to land or where to focus uh, their attention <clears throat> on the chessboard and in the game. Yeah. Exactly. And, and chances are, you know, I mean, hand in hand with the spectator um, policies and stuff, um, mm -hmm. if someone is soliciting an advice from someone, you're not only going to deal with the player, but you're going to deal with that from someone as well. Right. So, you, you know, you're going to you're going to deal with both aspects of this, um, mm -hmm. you know, and they're, they're going to be out of their, you know, as the baseball expression. Um, <laughs> so, you know, so, yeah, solicit, solicit that advice. Um, do we have any more? things to cover from us uh no uh that's the uh, oh didn't want to get the trivia there uh so i think that's it for our aspect of player conduct um using additional resources uh anything else we wanted to add jim before we get into the uh wonderful trivia that i'm sure everyone came to tune into tonight no but you know these are the fundamentals about uh, ethics and good sportsmanship in chess and these are things that whether you're a TD or a coach, uh, a parent, you really need to, to understand well and, and communicate and teach other players who are just coming into the game. It's kind of the basics of, of understanding uh, of proper behavior. And to me, a lot of this is um, pretty much common sense, right? I mean, it makes mm -hmm. just complete common sense that you can't, if you're playing a game of chess, it's you that has to play it. It can't be someone else. It can't be another. Right. It can't be a book. It can't be a computer. It can't. You know. Yeah, you can memorize all this stuff, but you can't go while you're playing the game and go and, and you know and research right. all that information. So yeah. you know, it's pretty much common sense. Anyway, let's get on to the trivia. So um, you know, it's favorite part of the night for everyone. So I am going to open up the poll here. So remember to type your answer one, two, three, or four in the chat. Um, you don't need the quotes. And remember, if you type anything in with one, two, three, or four in it, it's going to count as your vote. So watch out if you're typing numbers. So Bob is recording the game in his personal scorebook. And we all love those, right? Jim, who is Bob's opponent, makes a claim that Bob is looking back at other pages in his scorebook. Um, what would you do? Uh, would you, one, do nothing? And, and basically ignore Jim, deny his claim. Two, would you warn Bob that he cannot look back at previous games in his scorebook? Uh, three, same as two, but also add two minutes to Jim's clock. Or would you four, question which games Bob was looking at, and then reserve judgment on a penalty until you gather this information? Um, we might not always have the fullest answer that available out of uh, um, you know the trivia answers, but um, pick what you think is the best answer um, out, of, out of the four options. So we've got, we've got some varying opinions already, Jim, which is very interesting. Um, we've got a couple of votes for two, one for three, and one for four right now. So we're, we're split, um, and this is what we want. So we want, we want split yes. answers. The whole idea yep. of coming up with some of these answers is they're not as clear as, you know, it's definitely, you know, the answer is one, two, three, or four. Um, some of these things could be, um, you know, uh, you, you could have a, um, an opinion on whether which one is correct right. or not. Um, so please go ahead and vote, folks. So if you've taken a second to vote, 
one, two, three, or four. Okay, so I'm gonna close the voting here on this one. And so Jim, we had um, half of the people that voted, we had three votes for number four, uh, and then we had two votes for number two, and we had one vote for three. So okay. how, how would we handle this? Well, I'm, I'm first of all glad to hear that nobody voted for one. I think intervention is by the TD is warranted here. Um, I would start, though, first by talking to Bob, asking him what he was doing, what he was looking at, and see if he would be forthcoming with some of the information. And, and if I felt that just based on his own information that he was looking back at other games that may be related to his game, at least, uh, it would definitely be number, number three. Uh, I, though, personally would take some notes uh, as to what move they're on and perhaps even after the game is completed, depending on the outcome, look at, uh, look at the scorebook and see if I found more information that, that indicated he was looking at other games that matched uh, the position he had reached. Uh, if you're well into the opening, for example, and he knows he got lost a little bit a, a few games ago and was trying to, trying to, uh, not make the same mistake twice, uh, that would certainly be warrant for the penalty than a two minute delay uh, addition to his opponent's clock. Right, um, and one of the things I was saying with this question as well, it, it does uh, it does matter to me at what stage of the game they're in. Like if they're yeah. on move three, um, I, I think I'm just warning Bob at that stage. If they're on move seven or eight, then uh, you know, then I might dig more into it. If they're on move 30, um, you know, what, what use at that point is looking back on the scorebook, um, you know, unless he has some sort of notes or something, um, you know, I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But yep. um, also one, uh, so yeah, so there could be various answers as Jim said. And then one thing uh, I wanted to mention at the National Open, um, we, we like everyone to use um, certain score sheets, um, but, um, and so we don't want them using their personal scorebooks, but if they insist on doing that, we actually proactively will walk around with elastic bands or clips and make sure we give them to players so that these scorebooks stay held open on the pages that are relevant for that particular game. Um, so we give them those and, and let them keep them throughout the tournament. So if they're using a scorebook, we, we sort of force them to keep keep the page open. Uh, of course, we prefer them to to answer, you know, to use our score sheet so that we right. get the carbonated copy. Um, yeah, and as Harold uh, Stenzel is saying, answers two and three imply that Bob is guilty um, without actually having asked him. Um, <clears throat> and that's why I would talk to Bob right away. Yeah, you know, exactly. You, yeah. you can't assume. Yeah, because if Bob turns around and says, I wasn't doing that, then then you've got, yeah. you know, then then it's like right. a touch move instance, you know, yep. where yep. Uh, yep. you may be, you know, you, there's not a lot you can do about it. Uh, but you'll be, you'll definitely be keeping an eye on Bob uh, probably throughout the rest of that game. And you may also proactively, like I said, give Bob something to hold that scorebook open on that page so that he, he can't get into trouble uh, for the rest mm -hmm. of the event. All right, let's move on to question two. Uh, I'm going to open the voting here for all those that read quicker than I can talk. Uh, Tim, uh, we all know Tim, right? Tim complains to you that his opponent, Yuri, is continuously writing down a move, erasing that move, writing down another move, then making the move on the board. Uh, you go over to the board and witness that Yuri is indeed doing this and see various erasure marks on the previous moves. However, you are using variation one uh, for rule 15A, which is the one that allows the move to be um, written down on, uh, you know, on the page before it gets made on, on, on the board. So what would you do? Um, so would you one, do nothing, deny the claim as this is allowed in the event, uh, two, warn Yuri that he must stop this practice and only write down the move he plans to make or has made. Uh, three, same as two, but also add two minutes to Tim's clock. Or would you four, go the whole hog and just forfeit Yuri and save yourself any um, further hassle? <clears throat> so go ahead and vote now. So... I've only got three votes so far. People are still thinking. They're like, mm, mm. <laughs> it's okay, folks. We all see it more than we like to. Let's put right. it that way. Yes. 
Of course, the simplest thing is to just not use the variation, to use the actual rule um, that says mm -hmm. you, know, you, you have to make the move on the board first. <laughs> but alas, well. That wouldn't be any fun, though. Yeah, right. <laughs> then we won't get questions. At least like for this. this presentation, I should say. Right. <laughs> Okay, so we've got six six votes in. I think that seems to be where, where the number of views we are right now. Um, so let's let's go ahead. I'm going to close the poll off uh, here. So please don't uh, vote again. Um, so uh, five out of six people went for two, um, and one person went for one. Hmm. I think uh, I think the rule book is pretty clear that number three is the correct answer. If you go to 15A variation one, it spells out this example uh, and says that uh, the warning should be given, but that two minutes should be added to the opponent's clock. Yeah, I mean, uh, again, you know, um, I, to me, I'll, if, if I only see that he's done it a couple of times, you know, I might just warn him yeah. anyway at that point. But if, if I see 15 eraser marks and he's doing it every move, uh, I liked mm -hmm. your idea uh, of just taking his pencil off and give him a pen. <laughs> there you uh, go. Uh, <laughs> yep. That was, uh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, um, yeah, you know, it's, uh, um, it, yeah. So you, you want to stop them from doing that. So it's okay to, um, actually the rule says that it's okay to write the move first and then make it on the board. But you can't write the move and then continuously keep erasing that move right. and then write in a different move and then erase that and write it, you know. You, you can't do that. So you need to stop that. And right. as the rule says, it, it is sort of note-taking. Um, and at that right. stage, you've, you've got to put a stop to it. And so, when you put it in the context of an electronic recording device, you know, obviously you can't make the move first. Right. Well, yeah. Because you mean, can actually the, see it on the board. So the, the electronic score sheets don't. Yeah. You know, if you yeah. use it, this is only the paper variation. No, no, no. I get that. Ones. But in the yeah. spirit of the rule, yeah. You know, uh, you know it's, yeah. it's, it's the same kind of idea in, right. in that you're you're making it, you're writing it down, you're giving yourself a note, evaluating it, and then exactly. going from there. So. Yep. So, okay. So uh, let's move on to question three. Some good questions. Uh, let me open up the voting for question three. So remember, type one, two, three, or four in the chat. Uh, in a scholastic tournament, you notice a player who picks up his piece, then looks over to the spectator area before releasing it. Uh, you watch them do this for the next two moves, but cannot see anyone in the spectator area acknowledging the player. What do you do? Um, and there may be, I, I mean, there might have been one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. You know, there could have been a bazillion <laughs> things you could yes, do. Just, yes, there just are. Just go with what you think is the best out of these answers that we gave. Um, would you, one, go stand directly in the line of sight of the player? Uh, two, go to the spectator area to see if you can identify who they are potentially trying to communicate with. Uh, three, warn the player not to look at the spectator area. Or four, just, just forfeit the player. So we have one vote in right now. Come on, folks, don't be shy. Oh, wow, it looks like we have a consensus on this one. So the, our first time of... Uh, not having a split. So we've got five votes in so far. Is there anyone else brave enough to uh, six votes in? I think six is where we've been at. Is there anyone else viewing that can vote? All right, let me go ahead and close that off real quick. Uh, so we had six votes and everyone voted for uh, answer number three. Okay. Uh, Jim, uh, how would you... Um, I, I, I mean, that's certainly acceptable. I always try not to interfere with the game as much as possible. So I might start with number two. If it's a parent and it's a young child, maybe a first tournament, if I could identify that person and ask them to stand in a different location where the uh, child couldn't see them, that might remedy the situation without interfering in the game at all. But uh, certainly that's not a guarantee that you're going to find that person. And then number three would definitely be my next step. Right. 
Uh, yeah, for sure. And um, so I, I was given, an, uh, and Enrique Weathers in, in, in the chat can attest to this. I had a very interesting situation um, in San Diego at National Junior High where I had one kid that was doing exactly this. Um, and he would lift up the piece and the coach who was standing there watching the game uh, with a bunch of other people would either nod his head or shake his head um, when, when the kid picked. <laughs> so instead of doing any of these, I actually backed off um, went to the side wall, took out my phone and started recording um, what was going on. So, um, yeah, just and then um, obviously the kid got forfeited and um, I asked the, the floor chief, who was Enrique Weather, to, to, to make sure those coaches never came back into the room um, ever again. Uh, and for the most part, he, he agreed with that. So, But I won't get into that. Mm -hmm. He just liked to cause me some pain, I think, uh, in that particular event. So, <laughs> um, yeah, so anyway, so... You know, um, you definitely do whatever you can to stop it, I think, uh, at that point. Um, you might even go behind the player and see if you can see who they're communicating with. But um, you might want to um, stop the player from doing this. Um, <laughs> yeah. And Enrique said it was a good event for pain. It sure was. Um, <laughs> anyway, so and that's twice it's come up now. That same event has come up in the, the TD show. Anyway, let's move on to question four. Um and I'm going to uh, open the voting for question four. So vote now, one, two, three, or four. Black on board 37 uh, complains that his opponent is copying the moves from the demo board for board two, uh, which is up on a stage at the front of the room. Uh, white, oh, white's, no, white is facing, so he can see the demo board by just looking up. And uh, you verify the position after 13 moves is identical to board two. Uh, what would you do? Uh, would you want nothing deny the claim two one white he must not look at the demo board three reposition the board so white can no longer see the demo board or four just forfeit white for for using additional resources i guess copying those moves one two three or four <laughs> we have no votes yet what is going on <laughs> everyone everyone saw the question and left they ran out <laughs> I think oh. you you had somebody even ask you this as you're going through the earlier slides. <laughs> oh, Enrique, you have to give everything away. I want I want, but people can read what he said in the chat. But yeah, uh, you know, Enrique says technically both players are playing the same moves. Maybe. Yeah, m <laughs> maybe the people on the demo board are copying board. Uh, 37. Who right. Are? Yeah. Maybe the people on board <laughs> two are copying board 37. You know? Or board two. Yeah. Board two. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or maybe the demo board is really board 37 <laughs> and not yeah. board two. There you go. You know, you, you want to give everybody a chance to be in the Give spotlight. everyone a shout out to be in the spotlight. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Any more votes? We normally have six votes. We only have four right now. There's a couple of people have ditched us, I think. These, <laughs> question, these questions are either not tough enough or they're not fun enough or they're too hard or they're, yeah, it's fine. There's, there's no way these questions are ever coming up in my TD life. Yeah, well, the, the first time you have that happen, you're going to be saying, wow, yeah. I remember that question from the TD show. Well, I think yeah. we've, Chris, you and I were talking. I think we both had all of these situations come up before. So, yeah. So let me go ahead and we've got six votes in, I think. So let me go ahead and close the voting. Um, so we had five votes for three and one vote for one. Uh, what, <laughs> what would you do, Jim? <laughs> well, my first instinct was to reposition the board. But you point out that uh, to me earlier that it does say white can no longer see the board and I was thinking either white or black but uh, if you just turn the board around black now can see the demo board and white cannot see the demo board <laughs> right. I don't know of anywhere in the rules that say that I mean you can, you're allowed to get up and walk around and look at the games whether yeah, it's a demo board or the, you know. the key to me is like Enrique pointed out I mean black is also playing the exact same moves that they're playing on, on board yeah. two as well. So yeah. both players are playing the exact same moves. Now, is it unfair that white can see what's going on? Um, sure. But I mean, there's, 
there's no way you can say for certain. I mean, it, it wouldn't be uncommon after 13 moves to get mm-hmm. two posi- two positions being the same uh, in the same room, you know, depending on how right. many boards have been playing. Um, I think the assumption is that the lower rated player is is uh, white here and uh, it's just copying yeah. moves to try to keep up with the higher rated player who's you know uh, who knows right but um mm-hmm. you're you, right you, who knows but the assumption you know you assume. like, like you said you know it could be bod 2 is copying 30 save highly unlikely um bod 37 like i said may have you know decided that uh, between them that they will um put their result based on what happens on board two um and sort of copy those moves uh who, you know it's 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 a a silly sort of question but to me uh both players are repeating the moves so how can you punish one over the other right, um right. now one of the options that came up in our conversation was you take that game and put it in a different room right um right. so neither one can see the board um so you, you know you have options um i came up with the situation that came up in the isle of man um contest where there was the two boards um right next to each other and I think there was GMs playing, and the same position arose after like seventeen moves. Both that you know they were all playing the same moves, and the chief arbiter in that instance, uh, sort of a really unusual situation, mm-hmm. but decided to take one of the boards and move it to a different part of the room, so they weren't all sat next to each other anymore. And then they varied moves very soon after and played separate mm-hmm. games. So you know, so this sort of thing does does mm-hmm. come up every now and again. Uh, but yeah, yeah, I mean this this one to me. Um, however you want to handle it, but, um, you know, uh, I, not uh, someone saying didn't one of the GMs sit down at the wrong board. Not in that Isle of Man tournament, that's for sure. They were they were all playing at the right board. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't do anything. I would just deny the claim and point out to the other player that, um, well, you're also copying the moves too, you know, with, you right. know, like maybe, you know, hold off on your next move or something and don't, you know. Right. Like but as silly as it is, you know, I've had I've had players come up to me before and, 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 and claim that their opponent was cheating by copying moves right. up from another board. So Yeah. Yeah. I mean there are a lot of games going on in the same room. Invariably you're gonna get a situation where the same position has arisen arisen after a few moves. You know, if everyone plays E four, are they all copying each other? You know, I don't yeah. know. So anyway, let's move on to question five. Uh, and I will open up the votes for question five. So vote now by one, two, three, or four. Uh, you walk past the game involving Wesley, coincidentally, and Arnold. Um, <laughs> you notice some notes, uh, remember to drink and take your time, uh, written on Wesley's score sheet. Um, Arnold doesn't seem bothered by the notes. What would you do? Uh, would you, one, do nothing as Arnold hasn't made a claim? Uh, would you, two, warn Wesley he cannot write any such notes on his score sheet? Three, give Wesley a new score sheet and ask him to either transcribe the existing score to this one or keep score from this point onwards, warning him not to write any further notes on his score sheet. Or would you four forfeit Wesley? Four, four. Fit. One, two, three, or four. Wesley writing some inspirational, well, not quite inspirational notes, but some, some memory aids, shall we say. Yeah, uh, I don't think Q is a vote. Ah, there we go. One. He should add remember to me. Right. Is this the first time Wesley has done this? <laughs> <laughs> That's the question we're getting asked in the chat. <laughs> yes. Stop it with those situational answers, will you? <sighs> Pretend this is the first time that you've walked past and you've seen this. Yeah. Let's go with that one. Maybe next time don't use Wesley as the uh, name of the player. <laughs> I, I don't know if Enrique is asking that question just because or whether he's he's actually... Is this FIDE rules? No, we're talking US chess rules here, obviously. We're, we're doing the TD show, as a, a, not the Arbiter show. Uh, I guess that's, that's next. Uh, we're talking US <laughs> chess rules, uh, Harold. Always, always on this show, we're talking US chess rules. We, we care nothing about FIDE rules. No, no, it's, it's not true, but... Or FIFA.
Wow, I don't think anyone is. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, we got six votes again. So I think let's, any more for any more? Six votes? I think that's about our, our regular stuff. So based on US chess rules, obviously, um, we had four people say one and two people say two. Um, interesting. Um, how about you, Jim? Uh, my first answer that I wrote down was three. Uh, try to remove any notes there from the from access to Wesley. Uh, ask him to write down the uh, moves onto a fresh score sheet and warn him not to do it any time further. Again, we're all assuming that this is the first time that this has happened. First time you observed it as a TD. 